So this represents just the tip of the iceberg of our capacity, of our power, of our ability. And so when we come here, we're coming here for three purposes. First, to reconnect with the university. I'm going to challenge everybody here to do one thing before you leave. Find something, whether it be a student to mentor, a student group to support, someplace to invest your time, energy, and money, something on campus that you're ready to say, I'm prepared to invest my capacity, my skills, my ability, my time, my resources into it. Second thing, I want you to connect with alumni. I, had the, I, I was here with alumni class of 82 to 88. Now, that was a strong era, I know, and so it's hard to replicate that. But I will say this, one of, the, one of the things that I've learned in working with the alumni is the same rich experiences that I had with the class of the 80s, I now have with people from the class of the 90s, and the, and the 2000s, and the 70s, and the 50s. And so I want to challenge you not only to reconnect with the alumni that you know, but find alumni that you don't know. And what you'll find is the same beautiful, strong, intelligent people that existed while you were here at Brown existed before you and after you. But in the end, I want you to have a memorable experience here at Brown that reconnects you not only with the university and with, with IPC, but reconnects you with the people who really are the Brown University. Hi, my name is Tiffany Scott. I'm the class of 1998 and I am the chair of the reunion committee for the Black Alumni Reunion. I'm, the reason I thought it was important to plan the reunion is because I think there's power and value in bringing alumni together. Um, we actually had an event um, back in D.C. in January 2009 where we invited alumni to come back and just celebrate the inauguration. And at that event, we expected only 75 people, but we got about 400 alumni that came through. So based on that, we're thinking we need to bring people together again, not just for a few hours, but for a whole weekend. So that's when we started planning this event, and we've been overwhelmed by the number of people. So with that in mind, though, I would like to share. I had some similar emotions last night because everybody I met was a superstar. <laughs> you know, they were the head of this, the head of that, and, and I'm not sure that Brown maybe is going to be known as a pre-law school. I'm not sure about that, but I met a lot of lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed that, though, and, and <laughs> medical leaders, foundation heads, deans, presidents, vice presidents of universities, people doing original things that I never even knew black people did, you know, <laughs> theater producers and everything. But it was just, an, I, I tell you, it felt good. It really felt good. I wish, you know, I'm, I'm happy to share that with you. And it really, it meant a lot. So that was one thing I wanted to emphasize, the joy of seeing so many superstars and just casually, you know, all brothers and sisters, just casually, but really, really, as we stay, take care of business. You probably, we used to use that term a lot. You probably never heard that, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> got the challenge of getting to $250,000 for our first IPC endowed scholarship. That's part of our Alumni of Color initiative. It's the first time that an Alumni of Color initiative at all has been part of the overall university campaign. The campaign ends December 31st. Now we're going to continue raising money for Third World Transition Program, for TWC, for Africana Studies, 
for Brown Fund, for a number of other things, and for other scholarships in the future. But we've got to get this done by the end of the year. And so we're going to be asking each and every one of you to join us in stepping up and doing whatever you can to help us get there this weekend. Uh, by the way, if you're concerned about not having the cash right now, we want cash, obviously. <laughs> but uh, but if, you, if you need to spread that out a little bit and do it in terms of a pledge, we can take pledges and we can count that in, but we've got to get to that 250,000 number. We really have to do better. And this is not only for the current students, but it's for the alums and it's for the faculty. I feel that we really do need to get to know one another and build relationships with each other. Make yourself available. We must support and encourage one another, respect and look out for one another, appreciate and love one another, because it's the conversations you have and the friendships you form that you'll remember most. So if we could, let's welcome one another to eat together at the dining hall, help each other with homework, greet each other when we see each other in the street, and what have you, and let's strengthen our community and form what, what, and form what may be lasting impressions and relationships, because in the end, that's what's really important. Thank you. So I, I've been arguing, I'm a, I'm a sociologist, and so the perspective I take on education tends to be one that not just looks at what's happening in schools, but what happens outside of schools. And I've been arguing for a long time that the achievement gap is really about inequality. Right? That is, it's about disparities, not just in learning outcomes, but disparities in income, disparities in opportunity, in health, et cetera. They all impact child development. They all impact school funding. They all impact the conditions. So just to speak briefly, waiting for Superman, which is going to get people crying, doesn't deal with inequality at all. Doesn't deal with racial segregation at all. It's, it's like the big issues that face our communities, not part of that conversation. So um, part of what I've been doing I, for the last 20 years or so is trying to change the conversation. I, I agree with that comment. You know, I agree with the comment about um, how the movie opens and, you know, um, you know, if people don't understand the circumstances that we're trying to fight against, they're never going to be able to make decisions um, with enough information about what needs to change. Um, and it's why we have to change who's there. We have to change who's a part of the conversation, who's a part of the decision. It's a wonderful feeling. It's a comforting warmth that just comes over me. Just great times we're had here, and I'm loving it. I'm glad to be back. It feels like a family reunion. You haven't seen your cousins, people that really informed who you are right now. You're able to have some perspective and really appreciate what Brown gave you as a person. It feels familiar and foreign. It feels familiar in the sense that the, the campus has, it doesn't, hasn't changed that much. And people were saying, you know, because of the architectural concerns of the city, there's not that much room for them to grow. So this campus architecturally looks very similar, and that's comforting. But it does feel foreign in the sense that it's been 20 years, and I don't remember where anything is. I don't remember the streets. I feel like I just don't, I have to get re-acclimated. So the weekend is good because it's giving me a, a re it's not just a nostalgia, it's like a get to know it again vibe. So, yeah. But it really felt good. I spoke at two classes yesterday at the music department. I was the guest lecturer, so it felt wonderful to have been an alumni that was returning in a professorial capacity. But there were laws and rules that pre prohibited mass immigration. It's not until the Immigration Act of 1965 that opens up non white immigration. This changes all communities of color, especially. 
but especially the black community. So now you have, after 1965, large numbers of people coming from all over the Caribbean, all over the continent of Africa, all over Latin America, who are black, in the sense that we would use that term, but they're not African American, culturally speaking. So then they have kids, and then their kids apply to Brown, because we opened the door for all of that, and then, what happens? They come to campuses and they're like, well, I'm starting a Barbadian society. Oh, no, 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 no. We need a Jamaican society and a Ghanaian society and a Kenyan society. Like, well, no, no, let's just use black. No, nah, because your notion of black and my notion, oh, Lord, the conflicts? Drama, major drama every year. Like, okay, hold on. We got 37 black groups and I think we have 39 black people. Can we... <laughs> Can we find an umbrella term for us? Just, just that something we can get along. We seem to all eat rice. Can we, or be, you know, can we, can we just get, you know, I feel like Rodney King. Can we just all get along up in this piece? Because I know when we came in, there was no question that you were going to be a part of OUAP. There was no question that you were going to participate and support a financial aid, whether you were on it or not, if there was a demand to be made. And so I guess my question is where along the line, you know, did that, torch passing drop yeah. such that when people arrived on campus they think that it's okay not to even give people the nod and so 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 i think in terms of us asking ourselves what do we want for our community that has to come back and maybe it's not around um, just because we're black um, and we've all been through some, you know, maybe that's not the common factor anymore, but I think we have to think about wh how can we bring that back? What can we rally around to bring that kind of community back? Because it's lacking. The thing I really want to encourage you all to do is to focus on this torch because, you know, the thing you pass along is not necessarily the equivalent of what they're going to do with it. But you have to pass it on. And you have to have faith in the next generation. What, whatever we were doing, there's a lot, and the we here is many different we's, is wonderful and terrific, but it is a new world. You know, Jamal has to figure out, he's a student of mine, I can pick on him. He, you know, Jamal has to figure out what he's going to deal with on his terms. I can give him my insight, but it's not 19 blah, blah, blah. Uh, and so, therefore, I have to really, I have to honor and trust that with the proper guidance and insight, they're going to do their own thing, and sometimes it's going to be different and that's okay. So I mean I want to encourage you all to to share with young people and not hold them to our standards as it were.